I would start right now. So Ryan, if you're feeling ready, we'll get started. Yeah. yeah. I guess so. Okay. Um, good. So um, just to so we're very pleased to have uh, Ryan giving our second talk of today. Um, he'll be talking about the usefulness of the strong exponential time hypothesis. Uh, Ryan's a professor at MIT. He's well known for his work on complexity in a variety of areas, including uh, non-deterministic exponential time, fine-grained complexity, SAT al al algorithms, and so forth. Uh, he's been, Ryan's been working with SAT algorithms for many years, so is I think, starting with his back, back with his backdoor work. I want to say sometime in the '80s, but maybe I'm wrong about that date. So um, '80s? No, when was it? <laughs> I, yeah, I I'm not that old, Sam. You're not that old. No, no, Ryan's way younger <laughs> than I am. <laughs> so uh, my uh, when was that? Don't don't even look it up. Okay. Starting with his work, and that was working, that was, no, that was 2003, right? Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I should have no, prepared no. the date. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to have Ryan here, and it, the floor is yours. <laughs> thanks, Sam. Thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, yeah, I feel a little weird giving a talk in a workshop on 50 years of satisfiability. Certainly, I haven't been active in research for many of those years, but um, after I thought more about it, I realized I do have some kind of history to tell. I, I hope you'll find uh, my stories interesting. Um, I don't actually guarantee 100% satisfaction with this talk. Um, yeah, it may, I, it's it's some kind of talk, and you know maybe, yeah. I hope, I hope everybody will get something out of it. I, we'll see. <laughs> so uh, before I begin, I'm going to make sure that we're on the same page with the with a notation for SAT. So so I'm going to refer to SAT as just satisfiable Boolean formulas in CNF. I'm not going to look at anything beyond uh, conjunctive normal form. Uh, k sat will be CNF sat where all clauses have at most k literals. Um, if you don't know what the, some of those terms mean, probably this is not the talk for you. I mean, it's probably not the, the uh, workshop for you. Okay, so two measures of the size of the formula. I will always use n to mean uh, the number of variables and m to be the number of clauses. Okay, um, just for you know, the fixed notation. So the best known worst case running times um, for SAT and KSAT uh, as a function of M, N, and K um, are not so great. So uh, as we all know, and um, if you've been following these talks at Simon's, SAT is solved all the time in practice. SAT solvers are great, but unfortunately there are instances in which they can do really badly. So the best case, so the best known worst case running times um, look like the following. So so for SAT, uh, this was first achieved, I think, by uh, Calabro and Paliozzo and Paturi in 2006. Um, uh, two to the n minus n over order log mn. Okay, so think of it this way. If the clause to variable ratio m over n is a constant, then you can improve uh, the base of the exponent in your running time by a constant. Um, but if the number of clauses is, say, uh, anything larger than a constant times n, let's say they're polynomially many clauses, then this running time is getting closer and closer to two to the n, okay? Now for, for k set, we know that for every constant k, you can get some improvement over two to the n. So the exponent, instead of being just two to the n, is two to the n minus uh, n over order k in the exponent, okay? But again, um, this is getting worse and worse as k is increasing, right? You're dividing but you're dividing by uh, a larger term and that's in that part you're subtracting out. So the, this exponent is getting worse and worse and this was first achieved as far as I know by PPZ uh, in 1997, um, Pudlock, Paturi and Zane. Okay, um, so there are dozens of, dozens of other papers on worst case, uh, case set albums. If I were to start listing them properly, I'd use a lot of time I don't have uh, if we have, if we look at just these big O terms, then um, these are really the best known worst case running times uh, as a function of MN and K. Now, subsequent improvements have improved these big O's, but again, we seem to have this kind of inherent dependence uh, on K. The, the running time improvement gets worse and worse as K is increasing, or as the number of clauses gets larger and larger, the running time gets worse, uh, either way. And there's a sense in which, um, 
which Calabro and Pios and Paturi also show that the, there's a connection between these two exponents. Um, okay. So the big question uh, for theory people is, can we improve the exponents uh, for these running times? So can, can we show uh, that sat is in 1.99 to the n time? Okay. Um, a maybe more ambitious thing is to ask is say three sat in two to the epsilon n time for every epsilon. So can I get um, 1.0001 to the n time for three sat for, and can I put 1.00 for any string of zeros I want uh, one to the end time. Uh, so can I just keep making the running time exponent uh, better and better? And it's known that through uh, MP completeness reductions, this would imply that all of KSAT has a similar uh, running time. Okay, this is, so the exponential time hypothesis of IPZ and Palazzo-Paturi and Zane conjectures no, uh, that this is not possible. Okay, and this is a vast, vast strengthening of P different MP. P different MP is saying three set is not in P, we're saying it's not even in sub-exponential time. Right, so this is a restatement of so-called ETH, exponential time hypothesis. Um, another question is, maybe weaker question is, is K set in 1.9999 to the n time for some string of nines? Okay, so is K set in two to the delta n times poly m time for some universal delta less than one? So can I get like some fixed exponent improvement regardless of what K is? So the universal means is independent of K. Um, so strong ETH uh, conjectures no that um, that uh, this is not possible. Okay, uh, so more formally, uh, for all possible improvements in the exponent, you know, something less than two to the n, there is some clause with k so that k set is not in two to that improvement uh, times n. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, something stronger. So strong ETH implies ETH, and this is. Uh, not obvious. You need something called the sparsification lemma um, to to prove this. But uh, so these are the two main conjectures, though, uh, it, about the worst case complexity of SAT problem, and they've been very useful. Okay, so especially uh, Seth or strong ETH. I like to say strong ETH so as not to I don't know um, bother people who are named Seth. Um, these hypotheses, they give many complexity predictions, okay? For, for problems in MP naturally, but also for problems within polynomial time. Um, so you can show that various polynomial time algorithms are optimal, uh, assuming this uh, strong ETH, okay? And so far, both these hypotheses are nicely consistent with general wisdom. So they are useful in a sense, okay? Um, so what's the point of this talk after setting out, um, you know, the, the main subjects of discussion. So what do I mean by the usefulness of, of strong ETH? So it could mean I'm about to give a talk about all these amazing consequences that uh, Seth has for the rest of theoretical computer science. Like it's at the heart of something called fine-grained complexity that uh, Russell was talking about in the last seminar of this kind. Um, yeah, I, I could be discussing uh, fine-grained complexity, all the implications of, of, of Seth. Um, well, I mean, for me, uh, you know, if I'm going to be uh, brutally honest about everything. Well, I, I believe strong ETH is false. Okay. Um, my belief is probably the minority op opinion at this point, and it, it hey, it may may even be wrong. Um, but the, the chances I'll be proved my wrong in my lifetime are, are nil. Um, right? I, I mean, like uh, I'd be super happy if someone <laughs> proves strong ETH is true, but. That's so much stronger than Peter from MP. Um, yeah, I think I'm probably safe uh, in that sense. But regardless, uh, the point of this talk is that this belief that strong ETH is false, independent of its truth value, it's been extremely useful uh, for me. It's been extremely useful. And so even if it turns out to be true, uh, my belief in the opposite has led me to many algorithmic ideas, which led to complexity ideas that I've never, I'd have never found otherwise. Um, so I will tell you about these ideas. So that's, that's what this talk is about. Um, this is, I mean, I can't tell you about all the results I prove while trying to refute strong TH. Like, you know, I have a lot of uh, failures, um, but this will be actually a history talk. It'll be a history of my uh, many failures <laughs> to refute strong TH um, and, you know, uh, recovery from the failure. I, I hope you will enjoy my futility. 
All right. Uh, uh, let's see. So, uh, so how to get into this in the first place? Why did I start thinking about this at all? Um, so some years ago uh, in Ithaca, New York, I was a teenager and I thought that three set was an NP. Okay. Well, I mean, since I only believe the negation of uh, strong ETH now, I guess in some sense, some progress has been made. Okay. Uh, you know, like I used to believe P equals NP and now I only believe negation of strong ETH. <laughs> okay. Um, so I learned about various case set algorithms from John Kleinberg's class uh, on, on algorithms. And, and in fact, my early belief in P equals NP is how I met uh, uh, Scott Aronson, another complexity theorist you might have heard of. We were both undergrads at Cornell. We were participating in some uh, CS project fair and he saw my project that was basically claiming P equals NP. And he sent me an email later saying, you know, you don't have to directly solve three set and polynomial time. There's this result, uh, which says you only have to satisfy seven eighths plus epsilon the clauses of a three CNF formula in polynomial time. And so this is how I learned about the PCP theorem from Scott. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, we were teenagers. We thought we knew it all. Um, so I, in July 01, I submitted a, a paper to SOTA uh, on solving quantified Boolean formulas slightly faster than exhaustive search in some cases. Uh, this was just from trying to uh, fix various algorithms that were uh, trying trying to solve three set and point on time. And uh, somehow uh, the paper got in. I still am not sure why, the, all the reviews are blank. Um, but Gerhard Verger saw it and he was writing a survey about exact algorithms. He sent me a draft for comment. Um, so we had two open problems, which are very interesting. Uh, one was to design an exact algorithm for a max cut with uh, time complexity less than two to the n. Okay, so the max cut problem, you have a graph, you want to find a partition into two uh, uh, sets, the nodes into two sets that maximize the number of edges crossing the cut. Um, another problem is assuming ETH obtain evidence for the strong ETH. Of course, uh, I think at that point, these were called, strong ETH wasn't called strong ETH yet, but this is essentially what he said. And I became obsessed with solving these kinds of open problems. Uh, got, I really, really got into these exponential time exact algorithms even though uh, you know, it was not very uh, trendy or uh, popular to do so, um, you know, it, it would just seem like interesting problems to me. Like there is a dumb algorithm that runs in two to the n. Uh, is this dumb algorithm the best you can do? You know, can you get 1.9 to the n? Um, this just seemed like uh, fundamentally uh, basic and interesting problems. Um, so, okay. So some years ago in, in Pittsburgh, I was a grad student and I was thinking about these problems and I became enamored of the end of the omega time algorithm for finding a triangle in an end node graph of Itai and Rode. This is such a beautiful algorithm. It doesn't take long to describe it. Uh, so let me do that. So what they show is that if M by M matrices can be multiplied in M to the omega additions and multiplications, then three click or the triangle problem. So trying to find a triangle in the graph, uh, three nodes that have all edges connected, this is an into the omega time. And we know that omega is less than 2.4. Uh, Christos mentioned Strassen's algorithms made these kinds of developments possible. The first algorithm beating uh, the naive uh, n-cubed algorithm. The latest improvement is from earlier this year. So at its most fundamental level, Itai and Rode are showing how a problem with an n-cubed size search space can be searched in into the 2.4 time instead. Uh, somehow you can prune this search space and, and get something with a, a better exponent, okay? So here's the proof, uh, it's, it's quite short. So let A be the adjacent matrix of our given graph, okay? And let B be uh, the square of this matrix. We multiply the matrix with itself, okay? And so the claim is that there is a three clique in the graph if and only if there are uh, entries I and J um, where AIJ is one and BIJ is, is not uh, zero, okay? And so it's very easy to see why this uh, works. So what does it mean for Bij to be uh, non-zero? It means that the sum over all k of Aik times Akj is not zero. Okay, and that can only happen if there is some vertex k so that I have an edge from i to k and have an edge from k to j. Okay, uh, right. This, this sum is it's just a sum of uh, uh, products of zeros and ones. Okay? And if Aij is one, that means I have an edge from i to j. Okay. And so I, I get a triangle, 
right? And this is the only way I can get a triangle. Um, so it's an if and only if, and you know, it's very clean. You just take the matrix, square it. We know we can do that in, in the omega time, and then we check uh, for we check this condition for all i and j. Okay, um, very very simple, very beautiful little algorithm showing how this faster matrix multiplication is can actually be used to to prune like a search space in an arbitrary graph. Okay, so I wanted to use this. Um, so in fact, you can count the three clicks. Okay, so I wanted to use this. Uh, to to somehow solve sat faster or some MP hard problem faster. So suppose we just thought of n cubed as two to the k for some k, all right? Um, and I don't, maybe k is like the number of variables in some other problem. Then uh, into the omega would be about uh, 1.74 to the k, okay? Um, so so that would be, you know, if, if this were like two to the n <laughs> for our running time, we'd be at 1.8 to the n running time. Okay, so if we could somehow embed a SAT problem into some triangle finding instance uh, with this property, then maybe maybe we could uh, solve SAT faster. Okay, so so I had this idea um, to express CNF SAT on K variables as an instance of triangle detection on two to the K over three nodes. Right, so if if we could do that, right, if we could take CNF SAT on K variables and express it as triangle detection to the k over three nodes, then you know, plugging this stuff in, we would have it um, 1.8 to the n time algorithm for CNF set on n variables would be done, right? Strong th would be false. Okay, well, of course I failed. <laughs> as we all know, strong th is still true as far we know. Edges can only encode so much. I was trying to push all kinds of information onto edges, trying to encode like uh, various conditions of like the CNF, it just seems that edges can only encode so much. Um, but I noticed later that edges can encode constraints on two variables. So if I'm looking at, instead of like a full CNF, I'm looking at clauses on two variables, I can encode these constraints with edges. All right, well, we already know that two set is solvable in polynomial time. But in fact, uh, we can do a bit more. We can in fact solve any uh, sort of optimization problem on uh, two variable constraints uh, faster. So this turns out to show that max uh, cut can be solved uh, slightly faster than to the end solving Gerhardt's uh, open problem. And ma max two sat can be solved and a bunch of other like optimization problems. If you want to solve them exactly, you can actually beat uh, exhaustive search. Okay, uh, so this eventually appeared in my, uh, in my PhD thesis, appeared in I ICALP 2004. Um, and along the way, I was trying to find, okay, you know, this one thing worked, this, this exponential time reduction really is what's going on. Exponential time reduction uh, from an MP hard problem like max cut to triangle finding, it worked. So can I just, if, maybe if I just find the correct polynomial time problem to reduce to, if I take, you know, CNF set reduced to another polynomial time problem, maybe that would work, okay? I found like many, many polynomial time problems whose faster solution would refute uh, strong ETH, but I failed to solve uh, any of them faster uh, so far. Um, but you know, taking the contrapositives of all these theorems, it end up forming uh, what is what is now or partly forming what is now fine grained complexity. Because assuming strong th, it means that all these polynomial time problems cannot have faster uh, algorithms. All right, so so that's kind of how it worked. Um, so here are some of the results. Uh, I'll just briefly mention. So so k dominating set is a, a very important problem in parameterized complexity, uh, which uh, Stefan Zeider talked about. A bit yesterday. So, so given a graph, we want to find a set of nodes uh, of size uh, at most k, such that that set union with its neighborhood is the whole vertex set. Okay, so this is solvable. Um, so the naive algorithm will take into the k plus one. You can solve it uh, close to in the k using matrix multiplication tricks. Um, so we showed, and this is work with uh, uh, Mihai Petroscu, uh, it eventually appeared in SOTA 2010. If you could solve it slightly faster, just even slightly faster for some k and for some epsilon, then uh, Seth is false. Um, there's this other problem, 2 sat 2. Given a 2 CNF with two extra clauses of arbitrary length, is it satisfiable? Um, maybe I can skip over this, but basically there's a naive way to solve it in squared. If you can solve it faster, Seth is false. There's this problem, d sum, uh, given n numbers, are there d that sum to 0? Even the case of three sum is actually fundamental in computational geometry. Um, 
uh, a lot of hardness of polynomial time problems is based on the assumption that three sum can't be solved faster. So we know it's solving into the ceiling of d over two time, and that ceiling is somehow important. Um, it means that three sum takes n squared time, and we don't know how to solve it faster than n squared time. Um, we we show that if ETH is true, then d sum has this kind of inherent curse of dimensionality. Uh, so you get uh, into the o omega d uh, time, uh, running time under ETH. And then finally, there's this, this very simple problem called orthogonal vectors, uh, which I was studying given a set of n binary d-dimensional vectors. Okay, are there two with inner product equal to zero? Okay, so just have a bunch of zero, one vectors. I wanna know if there's two whose inner product is zero. Really simple problem, okay? Um, it's easy to solve it in quadratic time. Just try all possible pairs of vectors, um, compute the inner product. Uh, we show that if you could solve it slightly faster than squared time, then uh, ETH is false. Okay, and um, so everyone cites these papers uh, as showing conditional hardness of various polynomial time problems. Uh, Seth, wow, if you just take the contrapositive, like Seth implies like all this like tight hardness of stuff and, and it led to a lot of other things. So for example, the the proof, so it's, it's known by Bakers and, and Indic that uh, computing edit distance needs uh, essentially n squared time under Seth, and it goes through uh, this orthogonal uh, vectors uh, problem. Um, so yeah, it's, oh, I, of course, I came about it trying to uh, refute strong ETH, uh, but you know, it's, it's nice to have a win, even when you fail. So you know, that's, that's what this talk is all about, I guess. Uh, right? So let me uh, mention how a faster OV will imply the negation of Seth, because the reduction is, is so simple, you can teach it to undergrads. Um, so again, like if we can solve orthogonal vectors with capital N vectors in slightly faster than quadratic time, then SAT can be solved slightly faster than 2VN, okay? And this implies by this so-called sparsification lemma. Sparsification basically says that for KCNF formulas, the hardest case is when there's a linear number of clauses. Okay, so then we don't have to worry about this whatever factor of, uh, of D here, the dependence on the dimension or the number of clauses. So, so this wouldn't refute uh, strong ETH. We have a, a explicit uh, epsilon that gets us faster running time. So here's the proof sketch. So given a, a CNF with N variables and M clauses, we are going to do an exponential time reduction. We're gonna construct a set of two to the n over two, let's say plus one uh, vectors. So that'll be our capital N. And they'll have n plus two dimensions. So number of clauses plus two. Uh, so that this set has an orthogonal pair, if and only if the original formula is satisfiable. Okay. And so if I can solve uh, this problem faster than quadratic time, faster than capital N squared, I'll get a faster uh, set algorithm. Okay. So let, let me see how the reduction works. So we split the n variables into two parts, p1 and p2, and they have about uh, n over two variables each. We could even assume uh, like n is even, so they have exactly n over two variables each. Then we make vectors for all assignments of the variables in a part. Okay, and this is how we get this capital N uh, here. So we'll have like two to the n over two vectors for the assignments to p1 and two to the n over two vectors for the assignments to p2. All right, so we'll make vectors for all of them. And here's how we make the vectors. For all assignments, A and P1, we make a vector V sub A, um, which has an N plus one component one, N plus two component zero, okay? And for all other components, I one uh, through M, the ith component is one if and only if the assignment A doesn't satisfy the ith clause of the formula, okay? So we put a one if, if you're not satisfying and a zero if you do satisfy, okay? And we do, a similar thing for P2, except we add, we flip the bits here for M1 and M2 to force us to, when we pick an orthogonal pair, we've got to pick something from P1 and something from P2. If we pick two vectors from, you know, this, of the same form, they won't be orthogonal. So, so it's just enforcing orthogonality here. And then we, we had the same uh, definition as before. Okay, so we're, we're putting zeros and ones saying whether or not you satisfy the ith clause. And then um, it's easy to see that orthogonal pairs in this new instance directly correspond to set assignments. So every orthogonal pair here directly corresponds to some assignment on the variables in P1 
in the assignments and the variables in uh, P2 that satisfies all the clause. Because the inner product is zero, it must be in every component, there's at least one zero. Well, that means that it, either you know, the partial assignment A satisfies the ith clause or the other partial assignment satisfies the ith clause. All right. So that's it. And um, so then if we have OV in subquadratic time, then we will get a faster SAT algorithm. All right. Um, yeah, but this is one of many, many such reductions. This is probably the simplest uh, such reduction, showing how you know the contrapositive is uh, if Seth is true, then in fact the this very simple quadratic time algorithm is in fact optimal. Right. Right. So about ten years ago uh, in uh, San Jose, California, I was doing yet another approach to solving uh, CNF Seth, um, and then the idea here was I would try to solve CNF set by expressing it as a problem on multivariate polynomials. So do some kind of so-called algebraization of the problem. Then I would want to use like algebraic algorithms like the fast Fourier transform to determine SAT quickly. So I had various ways of, of trying to do this, trying to use, you know, things like matrix multiplication, things like fast Fourier transform, things, you know, let's take advantage of algebraic structure and work surprisingly fast. So I would solve SAT using that. I mean, given everything I, you know, had done to that point, it made sense. Um, okay, again, this failed. Uh, it failed pretty badly. Uh, in fact, I got CNF stat algorithms, which are much worse than the best known, way, way worse. Um, but these algorithms work not only for CNF, but they work for um, things much more expressive than CNF as well. Um, so they work for AC zero circuits, so-called AC zero circuits, they even, uh, worked for the, these so-called ACC zero circuits, um, which I probably don't have any time to explain. A, for the purpose of this talk, ACC stands for annoying circuit class. Extremely annoying circuit class um, and very difficult to analyze for no apparent reason. Um, so I noticed that like, you can get some kind of improvement over exhaustive search, but this is much worse than 1.9 to the end. I'm thinking like to the end divided by like a quasi polynomial, say for example. Um, yeah, so this was pretty, this looked pretty bad, but it was a set algorithm for a class that we didn't know any lower bounds for, we knew very little about. So I thought it was kind of interesting. And I had already shown in earlier work that if you had set algorithms in certain cases for certain kinds of uh, circuit classes, then you could get circuit lower bounds. And so, um, I don't know, I stayed up for many hours and by the next day I had improved, I had proved that this implies, uh, so-called non-deterministic exponential time is not an ACC zero. Whatever that means, um, this was a notorious open problem in circuit complexity uh, for, for a couple decades at least. Um, and it was arguably much more interesting than refuting Seth, at least at the time. Um, and it, I certainly would not have found this kind of thing if I wasn't trying to refute uh, Seth. Uh, so I guess the moral is uh, if you try to refute strong TH, you might accidentally end up proving a circuit complexity breakthrough instead. Whoops. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, how it goes sometimes. Um, right, so uh, how much time do I have left, Sam? Uh, you're muted, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, you've been speaking a little bit over 25 minutes, so you've still got another. Okay. 15 minutes if you wish or whatever. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, I'm not gonna be right. too strict about the time. All right, there, there are no questions about uh, all this, I mean. We can pause so for a moment. Um, yeah. Sybil asked a question, do you want us to speak up? Uh, maybe it's a comment here. But determining B sub A is expensive and you get the model count for free. Um, well, for each vector, this oh, so I guess you're you're talking um, back at whoop, 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 whoop. this determining um, for all assignments the visa base is expensive. Yeah, it's a weird um, it's a weird reduction, right? Because it's not um, you know like at least the way I've written it is this is not the kind of thing you would you know this is not the kind of SAT solver you'd want to run in in practice. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by the model count for free. So the, the size of the instance you're getting is really large, but 
this is kind of inherent if we're going to reduce an MP hard problem to a polynomial time problem. Like if we believe ETH and we don't believe that SAT can be solved in say, you know, sub exponential time, and we're trying to use a polynomial time problem to solve SAT, there is going to, there has to be some blow up somewhere, right? In the, in the reduction from uh, SAT to, to the, oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, no problem. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's it is a funny way to try to solve SAT. Yeah. <laughs> it is, I, it is a bizarre way. Uh, you know, I, I don't recommend it as a way to solve SAT in practice. But if you're trying to refute a mathematical conjecture, right, I'll, I'll, no holds barred, right. So this is this was uh, my thinking that like there was so much innovation in polynomial time algorithms. Why not try to leverage it to solve SAT faster? Um, yeah, that was, okay. uh, all right, so yeah, more failure um, and then recovery from failure. Good. Um, yeah, so may, I'll talk a, maybe a, briefly about the, the ACC uh, SAT algorithm, um, just but, but briefly, okay. So this is, the ACC is constant depth uh, and or not in modium uh, circuits. Uh, where a modium gate takes a bunch of bits and it outputs one if and only if the sum of those bits is divisible by m. Okay, it's really, um, you know, it's just a divisibility check. Uh, where the thing in, so we know that like if you don't have mod m uh, gates, then there's very strong lower bounds against constant depth circuits. So they have unbounded fan and they can take in any number of inputs, but constant depth is, you know, it is pretty weak as a, as a circuit class. There are many, many uh, lower bounds. No, but somehow when you throw in like this mod M, um, things become weird. Like if the M is a prime, it's okay. I mean, there were techniques developed in the eighties to prove lower bounds there. But if, even if M becomes like a composite non-prime power, like six, all of a sudden uh, trying to understand like a circuit like this, let's see here, this is where the depth is three. Um, and M is, is six. Circuits like this are already like really, really difficult to understand um, somehow. Uh, it, the, the, the techniques that we know for uh, proving lower bounds on circuits just, just break down uh, already in this uh, apparently very easy case. So this is why I call it annoying circuit class. It's like something for which it must be weak, but, but we're, already, we're stuck uh, proving strong lower bounds for it. And so what I show was since for every fixed M and for every uh, fixed depth, there is some E such that you can solve uh, the SAT problem for such a, a circuit of even if it's sub exponential size to the N minus N the epsilon or this E time. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So the ingredients were a known representation of ACC via polymer. So everyone believed that there should be lower bounds for ACC because of a certain representation. And, and um, people are still trying to prove lower bounds because of this nice representation theorem. And it, it goes back to the early 90s. It says that every function computable by ACC circuit, so like from, from bits to a bit, can be put in the following form. It can be represented as a G of H's, where H is just some multilinear polynomial. So it has no squares. It has uh, K polynomials, uh, sorry, K monomials, where, where K is some quasi polynomial in N. Um, the over all zero one assignments, this H takes on a value between zero and K. So the point is K is not too large, okay? So K is just some nice polynomial. It's, it's sparse in terms of number of monomials. Um, and G is just some, just some arbitrary, it can even be made a specific type of function, but it just takes a zero one, uh, sorry, zero through K value and output zero one. Okay, so we can decompose ACC into this form. Um, and this just looks really, really easy. And in fact, the, the degree of the monomials are only like log of K. So in fact, it's like polylog degree uh, polynomial. So yeah, this is just some very tight, represent, very interesting representation. And uh, the ingredients are this, and then uh, using fast Fourier transform for multilinear polynomials to evaluate them quickly. And an interesting combination of those. I mean, I think I will skip over uh, more details of this, but, um, but those are all the, main ingredients that go in. So we're, we're using like something that people already thought would prove lower bounds to prove lower bounds. I mean, it's only for 
something like NX, but that has been improved many times over, uh, which is not the subject of this talk. Uh, but yeah, the point is that um, trying to refute strong TH led to a completely different thing, and I just kept going with it. And that's been a lot of my work uh, is trying to prove better lower bounds from SAT algorithms uh, in more recent years. Okay, so um, one, yeah, well, maybe two more anecdotes. Uh, so a few years ago in, in uh, Stanford, I uh, had yet another attack on Seth. So uh, I guess, yeah, Seth, okay. Um, so here I, I was trying to solve the orthogonal vectors problem in subquadratic time. So we saw that if it's solvable in less than n squared time, uh, strong th is false. So I was going for something even bigger, okay? And the high level idea is I was trying to take a circuit that expressed a group of orthogonal vector queries, like trying to determine whether uh, a group of uh, vectors had an orthogonal pair in it to a nice polynomial, some nice polynomial, and then use matrix multiply to evaluate this polynomial quickly on many, many points. Um, of course, uh, this failed. Um, but later we managed to get some OV algorithms which uh, turn out to imply CNF algorithms, which there are as good as the best known if you use uh, this reduction. So the OV algorithms really can't be improved unless we improve the, the best known uh, CNF set algorithms. But however, this idea which broke uh, horribly, it turns out it could be used to compute a different kind of inner product instead. So instead of trying to compute some group inner product, so uh, like, like uh, a bunch of uh, inner products in aggregate, it could do something else. Uh, so I didn't give up on the idea. And so I was thinking about other problems I was looking at. And so it turns out that it can be used to solve all, all pairs shortest paths faster. So just to recall, uh, all pairs shortest paths are given an end node graph with weights on the edges. And you wanna compute for all pairs of nodes, the shortest path between the pair, each pair of nodes. So you could think of it as computing the distance. There are many ways to formulate the problem. Um, it's a very fundamental problem in undergrad algorithms courses as a very natural uh, order in cube time algorithm first given by uh, Floyd and Warshall. Um, so the kind of inner product that I could solve faster was this sort of min plus inner product. So it's, I guess, uh, if you're a tropical ma mathematician, this would be a tropical inner product of two things. Um, somehow, uh, some people like to think of algebra with min and plus as tropical. So if you got two vectors in D dimensions, the min plus inner product uh, is you take the min over all components k of u, uh, k plus vk, all right? And it's been known for many years that to solve all pair shortest paths faster, it suffices to compute faster a min plus matrix product of two matrices. So this is where the min has been replaced by a sum and the plus has been replaced by multiplication, same up here, okay? So you're computing a bunch of min plus inner products over all these vectors, analogously to how you uh, how matrix multiplication computing a bunch of inner products. Okay, so, um, so it turns out that you can solve this problem faster using these ideas which broke for uh, solving orthogonal vectors faster. Um, so let me try to give a, a sense of the key ideas. So, so one is that if you're trying to compute a min plus inner product, this is actually an easy problem with respect to circuit complexity. Um, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive, but like, if you think about it, like uh, if, if I'm like, let's say just for simplicity, I'm, I'm writing down bit descriptions of all my weights. I need to add uh, weights together, like pairs of weights, and then I need to take a minimum of weights. So this is computable with so-called AC zero circuits, constant depth circuits with and or not, okay, of polynomial size. So these are somehow easy with respect to circuit complexity. And then the second key idea was to use techniques from lower bounds, um, like things that were used to prove lower bounds against AC0 and other classes uh, to get some algorithmic results. So it turns out that these easy inner products like this can be reduced to polynomials over F2 in a nice way. So this nice polynomial reduction I was trying to get, I can't uh, get it the way I would like for, for CNF sat, but I can get it for these min plus uh, inner products. And it uses this result of Rusborov and Spolensky that there's some randomized reduction from AC zero circuits to polylog degree polynomials. Um, uh, let, let me not go into that. We maybe if you want to know more, we can you can ask questions offline. But the point is, this is something that was used in 
uh, to prove circuit complexity lower bounds, and we're using an algorithmic way here. And then finally, like once I've reduced this this uh, min plus inner product to evaluating a certain polynomial over a bunch of assignments, then we can use things like uh, FFT. We can use things like uh, rectangular matrix multiplication to evaluate these polynomials fast. Okay, and the the upshot is that we get, um, in fact, now it's been made deterministic algorithm for all pairs shortest paths that runs in n cubed over two to the square root of log n time. Okay. Um, so right, n cubed is like what Floyd Warshaw gets you. And then this is like a, a, dis, a decisive improvement over uh, n cubed running time. And it turns out this was low for decades, whether you could get say n cubed over say a polylog factor for like, and let, let's say the log cubed or log of the four. Um, and it was obtained only by trying to uh, solve sat faster and failing, okay? Um, so it's still open uh, whether APSP can be solved in the end of the 2.999 time. Um, um, I think this is plausible. It probably has to take a different approach from the approaches I've been taking, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if something slightly related uh, works. Maybe use more structure uh, of the of the problem. Uh, but in general, this approach had led to several papers uh, with Josh Allman and Timothy Chan on finding exact and approximate nearest neighbors and various metrics. So this kind of polynomial uh, trick. So and that led to another another uh, line of work in algorithms. All right. Um, so I think this is my last. Uh, Anecdote. So a few years ago uh, in Stanford, I had an attack on the so-called non-deterministic set. So, you know, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, Seth is a bit difficult. Uh, maybe I can attack something that seems weaker. And so the idea was, so what's non-deterministic Seth? You, to refute it, let me just say what it takes to refute it. You need to give a verifier algorithm so that for every unsatisfiable CNF, uh, there is a proof of size, say 1.9 to the N, um, so that this uh, verifier on uh, F and P accepts and it runs in 1.9 in time. So the verifier runs in 1.9 in time. Okay, where N is number of variables. And so I wanna know whether these like small proofs of unsatisfiability, like faster than two to the N. So something faster than just writing down all the assignments and saying you failed uh, on those. Right. And it also should be that for every satisfiable thing, no such proof exists. So there's a, a, you know, a complete and sound a proof system for unsatisfiability. Um, of course, I, I failed on this too. Um, so I was trying to use polynomials again. Uh, the way, the approach I was looking at, um, I don't know, to, to abbreviate things, I kept running into polynomial identity tests and I was trying to like de-randomize very particular polynomial identity tests this is some notorious problem in de-randomization. It seems to require randomness. Well, as far as we know, like probably it doesn't, probably there are deterministic uh, algorithms uh, for polynomial DNA testing, but um, I didn't want to have to do that in order to, to <laughs> refute non-term success. So it turns out, so Russell and Palazzo, Mohan Paturi and students at UCSD, they sent a, me a draft of their paper uh, about Merlin Arthur Seth. So they had some version, uh, like some extension in non terms Seth. And I realized I could at least refute that. So, okay, I found, found a version of Seth that uh, I could refute uh, that appeared in, in CCC in, in 2016. And so the theorem is uh, given any Boolean formula of sub-exponential size, there's a Merlin Arthur proof system for determining the number of sad assignments to F using only uh, two of those n over two time, and it has two to the n over two linked proofs, okay? So, so this is Merlin Arthur. So what it means is that, um, so I, I wanna know the number of satisfying assignments. Okay, Merlin will send me a proof of this length. Okay, I am a randomized uh, verifier. I have the follow, like, so I'm a randomized algorithm. That's what this Arthur thing is about. So it's like, you know, a randomized version of non-deterministic Seth where the, the verifier algorithm is randomized. So if Merlin sends me a correct proof claiming that the number of satisfying assignments is, is, is uh, correct and is, fits the proof format, I will accept with probability one. But if Merlin sends me a claim that it's a different number, then I will accept with only low probability, okay? Um, and it works actually for any Boolean format. This is the only place where I, you know, I can say something, uh, you know, it's like, it's like 
just arbitrary formulas here, all right? Um, and trying to de-randomize this thing, you know, and get, uh, say, even prove that non-determinist success is false uh, seems, seems pretty hard. But um, hey, you know, um, who knows what can happen whenever you fail, uh, you know. Uh, all right, so let me conclude with some open problems. Uh, so one, uh, I wanna give more evidence that Seth may be true. I mean, maybe it is true. Um, I've been very productive assuming that uh, it's false, but you know, maybe it's true. <laughs> so, you know, maybe like try to show that ETH is equivalent to Seth in some way. Um, so there are many known equivalences within Seth and one paper of this kind is uh, Segan et al from CCC 2012. So they show that like, CNF satisfiability is basically equivalent to like SAT for AC0 linear size circuits for like more slightly more expressive circuits. Uh, getting faster albums for those is equivalent to getting faster albums for CNF SAT. Um, maybe prove that like the negation of Seth implies something actually unlikely beyond faster algorithms. So it's known that if Seth is false, then we get some circuit lower bound, but everyone expects a circuit lower bound uh, to be true. Um, so is there an interesting collapse of complexity classes? So all the lower bound consequences we know of, yeah, are expected. So, so uh, you know, is there something unlikely that happens if Seth is false? I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, so is there more evidence that Seth is false? Okay, so this is my, my side. Um, so there are various uh, strengthenings of Seth I have put here, super strong ETH, which I think has been mentioned before in some seminars. So prove, just show that this dependence on K and the exponent can be improved. So show that there's some unbounded function F so that K sat is in to the N minus N times F of K over K. So like, let's say, let, let F of K be like log K. So like I can subtract more from the exponent than just a, a factor of like one over K. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's this, I mean, this seems also false, but it is, it's nevertheless consistent with all the algorithms we know of, all like randomized uh, algorithms, local search, backtracking, they all hit this wall of N minus N over K. Uh, so, so it's still consistent with what we know. Uh, and then this N Seth is something I, I talked about before, non-deterministic strong ETH. And then there's a, another version that I actually don't know um, is false. So give a Arthur Merlin proof. And so I talked about a Merlin Arthur give an Arthur Merlin proof system for unset where Arthur speaks first. So in other words, the randomized algorithm tosses their coins, then based on those coins, Merlin sends a proof, and then they um, try to determine unsatisfiability. So uh, just a, a warning, like if you show that AM Seth is false, then you probably also show that there's a, you know non-deterministic circuits uh, that can prove unsatisfiability faster. So, I mean, I mean it still seems, plausible to me. Um, why not? I believe Seth is false, so why not? Um, and then finally an open-ended problem. So given a SAT solver, where SAT solver can be whatever you like, uh, if it runs in T time, is there a Merlin Arthur proof system? So, so a proof system where you, you can get a proof of, say, unsatisfiability, and your randomized verifier, you know, errors in its judgment of this proof with like very low probability, is there a Merlin Arthur proof system for verifying a trace in a uh, square root of t time? Um, so I have confirmed this thing is true when the SAT solver is basically PPZ. So with the MIT undergrad, we were able to show that you can get a Merlin Arthur proof system that has like square root of the running time of, of PPZ. Uh, so this is slightly better than two to the n over two. Uh, this is two to the n over two minus like n over k roughly. Um, this is a general open-ended problem about like uh, a proof. So I think like Merlin Arthur proof system should be uh, considered more strongly. Um, that's all I have. Uh, sorry for going over. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I see there's a lot of questions, so I have a lot of work ahead of me now. Thank you very much for the great talk. I'll, I'll applaud on behalf of everybody. Thanks. And uh, we have actually quite a few comments or questions in the chat window. We don't currently have anything in the Q&A, it doesn't look like. Um, yeah, yeah, so the solving APSP faster than n cubed refute Seth. Great question, I don't know. Um, 
yeah, we, we don't know of such a reduction. So, I mean, it, it kind of amounts to knowing um, whether solving APSP faster than N cubed solves orthogonal vectors faster, right? That would, that would do it. Um, as far as we know, yeah, we, we, don't, know, we, we don't know of any uh, such reduction like between all pairs, shortest paths and orthogonal vectors. Like, so if you think of these two polynomial time solvable problems, it, it kind of makes more sense to try to do this reduction, yeah. So APSP seems a bit um, of an island uh, in terms of fine grain uh, stuff from that from that point of view. Uh, so you know, getting faster algorithms for it is not going to crash a whole bunch of other <laughs> conjectures that have been made, unless there's been a bunch more made in the last couple of years that I haven't noticed. But okay, <laughs> um, great question though. All right, does de-randomizing PIT refute in Seth? This is an interesting uh, issue. So um, it turns out that um, basically because of the way in which we need to use PIT, um, it, it doesn't. So, so notice we only got, so let me go back. Yeah. Um, whoop. Yeah. So notice we only got a square root improvement uh, over two to the n here. Right, so we would, um, yeah, like we we would need uh, some kind of de-randomization that is actually um, faster than than like it's something beyond PIT. Like like we can in fact reduce this to a univariate problem where I have a, a circuit of size, let's say n. And it's over one variable and it's of degree n. Okay. And I want to know if this is identically zero. Okay. With randomness, you can you can test in basically linear time whether it's identically zero by just picking a random point over a sufficiently large field, maybe extension if you need, um, plugging it in for that one variable and evaluating the linear size circuit. Right. But uh, deterministically, um, even if PIT is in polynomial time deterministically, the best deterministic algorithm I know of is you've got to evaluate the polynomial in n plus one points because it's degree n, right? So you got to evaluate this polynomial on n plus one points. And it's, so it's not just a polynomial given as a sum of uh, terms in a nice way. If you had, F, you know, if, if it were like that, then you could use FFT to evaluate a polynomial in n points in like in polylog n. No, it's given as like an arithmetic circuit. Uh, so, I, so I give you like the size and arithmetic circuit over one variable <laughs> of degree n, even deterministically, even if PIT is in P, um, this seems to take n squared time because I've got to evaluate on n plus one distinct points to know whether it's identically zero. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it, uh, but, but still you could say like if, if the, you know, for like a depth, maybe it's a depth three, a depth four, I forget, like you know, a certain fixed kind of circuit over one variable, if you could solve PIT for it faster, then yeah, you would you would refute NSF. But okay, yeah. Okay, uh, does this MA algorithm work for circuits? Um, well, it works for linear size circuits because of this really old result that says linear size circuits are in uh, order N over log N depth. Once you've got something of order N over log N depth, then you get a Boolean formula of two to the order n over log n size. But yeah, I mean, so it works for circuits up to size like slightly less than n log n um, because of this uh, transformation, I guess due to Patterson and Valiant um, that uh, a size, a linear size circuit can be, can be made uh, to have slightly lower depth. But yeah, for larger things, no, I don't know. Like say it had a circuit of two to the little of n size um, yeah, it, it, well, it basically depends on the, the degree of the, of the circuit you get. So you're taking this formula, you're arithmetizing it, and you want the degree of that, um, polynomial you get from the arithmetization to be small. So if it turns out that somehow you did it for circuits in a way that the degree was not like enormous, um, then it, that would be fine. But yeah, I don't. I don't know how to do that for general circuits. Uh, okay, let's see. Does super strong in Seth 
uh, fail. Um, super strong in Seth. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, another great open question. Let's see. So proving Seth hardness of APSP requires refuting in Seth. Um, yeah, so this, this, is, this is from this paper of Russell, Mohan, and, and so on. So um, yeah, of course, I, ref, I, re, re, I guess I could have mentioned that, but I believe that in Seth is false uh, by the same slide. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they can show this because it turns out that non-deterministic AP, there's a non-deterministic uh, version of APSP conjecture. Um, so there is a non-deterministic algorithm which will just solve APSP faster than in cubed. <laughs> so non-deterministic algorithm uh, and co-non-deterministic algorithm. So like it will just generate uh, the matrix product you want and it will do so in less than uh, in cube time. Like, I don't know, into the two point something. Um, so if you had like a nice reduction um, showing right that APSP and OV are related, then you would have a non-deterministic algorithm for OV uh, for proving something doesn't have an orthogonal pair, um, and that would refute non-deterministic success. But yeah, so in this, I mean, what Marvin is pointing out is that APS. This is reason to believe that APSP may be easier, um, but you know uh, maybe there's also non-deterministic algorithms for for showing non-orthogonal vectors as well. Um, yeah, similarly, like getting relation between like um, threesome and OV uh, seems hard because there are non-deterministic ways to show that the set does not have a, a threesome solution. Good. Good, but yeah, I guess I, I could have mentioned that, but yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Do you believe there are non-trivial set algorithms for general Boolean circuits of poly size? If not, is there a weaker class where you draw the line? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, it doesn't, I guess the main thing about algorithm running times of the form to the n over n to the 100 is that it just looks so weak and I don't know how many people actually studied it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would like say believe it strongly but I just, I don't see why, I don't see any, like any reason to rule it out. I don't see any reason to think that like general Boolean circuits wouldn't have um, to the n over n of the hundred uh, time algorithm. I mean, yeah, um, I, just, I just don't know. I mean, this is probably, you know, this is, but of course I'm a guy who proved a, a theorem that said if circuit set is in to the n over n of the hundred, then nx not in p poly, therefore we should try to solve sat. So I'm probably the last guy you should ask. Uh, I'm a little biased maybe. Um, I want the hypothesis to be true, I guess, you know, implicitly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, comment from Paul, in the same way that MP completeness show that researchers in hard problems were really working on sat and didn't know it. I like to think of your results as saying that researchers on these problems in p were working on sat and just didn't know it. Yeah, I mean, refuting Seth and not knowing it, yeah. Um, although to me, it seems it's like refuting Seth is not going, it, to me, refuting Seth, um, it, to me, it signaled that refuting Seth was just like really easy because they're like, you could even go to Ponal time problems and solve them faster. I, I think, but, but yeah, but I, I like, I like your way of putting it, Paul. It sounds like a nicer way of framing my own work. So, 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 so good. Do, do you think that these better solutions uh, for problems in P type attacks are going to be the way to refute Seth. Uh, that leads me, yeah, that's, that, I guess I was just addressing that. Um, maybe not. Yeah, may, maybe not. Um, uh, probably the easiest way to refute uh, Seth um, would be to look more directly at the formula uh, and somehow under actually understand albums that run faster than exponential time rather than taking a MP hard problem, reducing it to polynomial time and then just running a polynomial time algorithm. Um, that seems to be a, a, better, a better way to try to refute Seth. Uh, I just thought that it was, I guess I was so convinced that Seth was false that I thought it could be refuted this way. <laughs> but it's probably an easier way to try. Along the way, I guess a lot of theorems got proved. So, 
So that's, that's some some positive outcome. Okay. There's also a question in the Q and A from all from Oliver Corton. Oh, okay. For these MP to P type reductions, like SAT orthogonal vectors, do they do they work for circuit lower bounds too? Showing a strong exponential circuit lower bound for SAT implies a tight polynomial circuit lower bounds for these problems uh, in P. Um, sure. Um, yeah, like, so the re reduction, yeah, I, they, they would work for circuits as well. Um, if you had a, a, a better circuit for OV, so you had a circuit that was subquadratic size uh, for OV, um, you would get a subquadratic, uh, sorry, a, a sub to the end uh, circuit for, for CNF set. Yeah, so a strong exponential circuit lower bound for set, uh, contrapositively would get a, a tight polynomial circuit lower bound. Yeah. Okay, VJ asks, have parameterized other than clause length K versions of Seth or ETH been proposed um, or studied? Um, yes, I think so. So um, in the original paper of IPZ, uh, so they show that if you parameterize by the number of clauses instead of the number of variables, like you're looking for a two little o of n, little o of m time algorithm where m is the number of clauses, this is basically equivalent to getting a too little o of n uh, time algorithm for like at least for three sets. Um, are there other parameterizations you have in, in mind? I guess the only parameters we looked at were m and n in this talk, but. but. Sometimes people look at things like tree, tree width. There was a talk yesterday by Stefan Sider about this. Oh, moment. right. Yeah, so there are definitely, there are definitely Seth based um, lower bounds uh, for like solving various problems in tree width. So like um, it's difficult for me to reconstruct them off the top of my head, but like say if the tree width is T and you want to of some graph and you want to solve this graph problem uh, faster, in many cases there's a, there's a C to the T times polynomial time algorithm. And it's known that if you got C minus epsilon to the T uh, time for various, uh, for these various problems, that then uh, things like Seth would be false. Um, so, so there, there, are in fact, relationships, I guess, between um, these kinds of things. But yeah, the, um, I, I, that that is a, a vast literature with lots of <laughs> different sub results. So, um, which I do not have random access to <laughs> in my head. So, yeah. So, I don't. Okay, Thomas Kochman has a question. I believe F implies Seth, don't you? Um, uh, I don't know, right? I believe Seth is false and ETH might be true. So I might not believe that. Uh, uh, what, um, are, am I getting things? So, we know that Seth implies F, right? Strong ETH implies ETH. Uh, I don't know. Um, that would be interesting. Um, I guess I just throw it out there because it's been one of these questions has been floating around for a long time trying to understand. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if someone came up with a like some uh, unlikeliness result. Like it is unlikely that we will prove this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I'm not like yeah about about ETH. I, I yeah, I'm I, I don't know. I, it, it's it's somehow it's hard for me to think about like getting a sub exponential time algorithm for three. There's only like a few things that I can that come to mind, but for Seth, a lot of things came to mind for me. So that's why I kept you know thinking it's false. So I keep having ideas. You know, that's my. So here you go, everybody. It's that's been my secret weapon. Um, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> um, would the failure of SAP imply anything about uh, collapses of complexity classes higher up, say in, in an exponential time or higher? Oh, um, 
The failure. Um, I don't know. I. Um. Yeah. I. I don't know of anything. Unlikely like that. Um. Yeah. It's. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not. I. I don't know of something like this. Um. I tend to think that the, I mean, just as the implications go that for higher complexity classes, it's only more likely that say, non-determinism equals determinism, but um, mm -hmm. so yeah, um, but this is a good, yeah, I don't know. I, um, yeah, for all I know, NX equals co-NX for something like that. And, um, you know, well, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. If if there's no more questions, uh, we'll thank Ryan again. I'll lead the applause. <laughs> thank you. And everyone else should be joining in. Um, so Thanks. thank you, Ryan and Christos as well. If he's still here uh, for a delightful pair of talks. And uh, so. Uh, we have another, I guess there's a chance to meet in Gathertown after this, is that correct? I'm not sure. Um, otherwise, uh, there is a fellows talk at 11. And thank okay. you again. Yeah, how much time is left? Uh, yeah, I, I can, I'll go to Gathertown. Uh, which which Gathertown, I guess is the, that's the oh, question. I don't, oh, um, okay. okay, Antonina. Antonina's Gathertown. All right, I'm, I'm going to Antonina's Gathertown and uh, see you there. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.